Good morning. We were wondering what the weekend would be like and didn't know for sure, so we thought it might be well to go ahead and put a message online. Brother Barry was so kind to allow me to do that. I had something on my heart. And so if you will, take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read there in just a moment. You probably have noticed the very popular advertising technique where they show before and after photos. Orthodontist, for instance, will show a picture of a child without braces and then a picture after the braces have been removed and show how wonderful it is for you to spend your money with them. Makers of hair pieces can illustrate how wonderful it is to have hair versus not having hair. Weight reduction industry does this a great deal. A person comes on and says, I lost 147 pounds on Dream Away. And uh, they neglect perhaps to say that they also lost two years of their life sleeping uh, in order to lose so many pounds. Well, Paul gives us a before and after view of man and salvation. And that's what I want to talk with you about this morning, before and after, in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. There are two purposes, I believe, in this passage in the book of Ephesians. The first is that it does add great attraction to the Christian life. We can see the difference that grace can make in a life. The second thing is it reminds us that above all else, being a Christian represents a radical change in our way of life. I don't mind telling you that I have been scared to death of what I see happening in Christianity today. Several years ago, some of the churches in America began to de-emphasize the need for a real change in behavior and in life patterns when a person becomes a Christian. But folks, I see much of the same trend among us as well. We more conservative movements uh, can see also that it seems that there is less demand for a righteous life. This is a broad-based phenomenon in religious life in America. I want to make this point this morning. When Christianity ceases to be different, when it blends into the culture it is changed to minister to, it ceases to be Christianity at all. So I want us to look this morning at the before picture and then later we'll look at the after. 
The before picture is very clear in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The sinner before conversion is dead, according to verse 1. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That is, insensitive to spiritual things. The corpse in the funeral home does not know at all about the gestures, the kindness of friends and family that come to visit at a time of one's passing. And I would urge that if there is something you want to say to someone or do for someone, that you do it while they're living and not wait until they've passed on. We were dead in trespasses and sins. The sinner left to himself is incapable of responding to God. He is dead. In verse one, it speaks of trespasses. This has to do with personal acts of sin. And then this word sin, also mentioned in verse one, speaks of sin as a habit or power in your life. All of us are sinners by birth. The scripture speaks of David and he said, I was conceived in sin. The idea is that from his very birth, he was burdened with sin in his life, the sin intent, the depravity that we inherited from our first parents. He said, I'm dead, not only, however, in that sin power that I received from my uh, forefathers, I'm also dead in my trespasses, my personal acts of sin. We are guilty before God because we have sinned. Before conversion, sinners are not only dead, but they are disobedient. Verse two goes on to say, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, the spirit which now works in the children of disobedience. Three forces are said to influence a person before they become a Christian. The world or the world system is one. He says, among, also, um, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, in the desires of our flesh and of our mind. The world, our world system, we walked according to the course of this world, Paul says in verse two. This world system puts pressure on men to conform. This is basically peer pressure. We speak of peer pressure a lot when we talk about teenagers, but truthfully, not only teenagers are affected by their peers, but adults as well. Adults too hear things like, here, let's have a beer together. And many of them are willing to give in to that sort of social pressure. Styles affect many. Fads, many people feel pressure to fit in to the course of this world. Biblical standards are made to appear obsolete, old-fashioned. They are appeared to be excessively restrictive, unnecessarily harsh, and even stupid. So this world is putting pressure on those who are living here. The second force that is brought to bear, especially on the unsaved person, is the power of Satan. It said, we lived according to the prince of the power of the air. He works through his agents, of course. He works through this world system, as I mentioned. He seeks to affect every one of us. His chief tool is lies. He is a liar. In John 8, 44, it says that he is not only a liar, but he's the father of lies and he lies about everything. He lied in the beginning to Eve when he said, you shall not surely die. 
if you partake of this fruit. And he's still lying to people, making them believe his lies about themselves, for instance. He tells people, you cannot change. Maybe other people can become a Christian, but not you. To some, he suggests, you have to be perfect. And of course, we know we can't be perfect, and so many people are discouraged. He lies about other people. He's the one who says everyone is a hypocrite. He lies about what is valuable. He lies about what will bring happiness. He lies about what is dangerous. But take it to the bank, folks. The devil is the father of lies. And we once walked according to the prince of the power of the air. We were under his influence. The third force that's acting on the center is the flesh or our sinful nature. He said in time past we walked according to the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. A preacher once preached a sermon entitled, Why Your Dog Does what he does. Interesting, I'm sure. He pointed out that your dog, your dog does what he does because he is a dog and he has a dog's nature. If he had a cat's nature, he would purr, but he does what he does because he's a dog. Man is a sinner. He has a sinful nature. He does what he does because the flesh is in control until he meets Christ. He does what he does because he's a sinner. The sinner then is dead. He is disobedient. He is also doomed. In the last part of verse 3, he said, We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Children of wrath, doomed to the wrath of of God. The unsaved man is condemned already. John 3.18 says that man is who does not believe on Jesus Christ is condemned already. We do not have to do one thing more. If you've never received Christ as Savior, you don't have to rob a bank or kill somebody or commit some horrendous sin. In truth, you don't need to do even one thing more because you're condemned already if you do not believe in the Lord Jesus. This is the before picture. We see in this picture that before we come to Christ, we were dead and disobedient and doomed. But now I want us to see the after picture See the small but very significant conjunction in verse 4. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy for the great love wherewith he loved us. Someone has said there's a great change when God butts in to our life. And that's certainly true here in this verse 4. But God, God made the difference. First of all, we learn here that he makes this difference because he loved us. God commendeth his love toward us, Romans 5 tells us, because even when we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. What he did for us is important. In this passage before us in Ephesians, it says that he quickened us. He made us alive. Even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Now we are capable of responding to God. Now we are capable of experiencing fellowship with the holy God. Now we are capable of obeying God because he made us alive. But we see also in verse 6 that he exalted us. He has raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
If you're not a Christian this morning, if you could but 30 seconds experience what I have experienced in coming to understand and appreciate the grace of God, the fact that he is willing to forgive me my sins, to accept me, to take me as one of his own. He raised us up. So there's no excuse for us wallowing around in the mire of sin any longer. We were in quicksand and we couldn't get out on our own. But he raised us. Why should we plunge back in? And then we see his purpose is an eternal purpose. Verse 7, he says, He did this because so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We have an eternity. And in that eternity, we'll be able to rejoice that God loved us so much, even when we were sinners, that he was willing to reach down, to touch us, to change us, to make us new. Folks, can you not see plain as the nose on your face that we are not to live like sinners? We are to live like sons because we are sons. Paul, in majestic terms, goes on in chapters 2 and 3 of Ephesians to describe this wonderful plan of God, how it was a mystery for many centuries, but now has been revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he finished extolling the wonders of the wisdom, love, and mercy of God in chapter 3, Paul opens chapter 4 with this exhortation. He said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He is calling us to a new life, a holy life. We are to walk like sons, not like sinners. We live like live men not those who are dead in trespasses and sins. We've seen here then the before and after pictures of the person who comes to know the Lord. I've known a number of people in my experience as a pastor and preacher who have been radically changed in their lives. People who would seem by men's standards perhaps to have even gone too far in sin, but whose lives were changed and made completely new by the grace of God. No one is beyond redemption. No matter what you have done, you still can be lifted up and made to set in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul indeed called himself the chief of sinners, and yet he was used mightily of God. I thank God that he saved me before I went so far down that road. But who knows what I might have been if he hadn't reached down and touched the heart of a young boy. Because even at five years of age, I recognized that I was dead in trespasses and sins. I was disobedient and I was doomed, but he changed me and he can do the same for you, the before and after. I hope today God will cheer your heart and challenge you to live a life worthy of his grace. God bless you.